Welcome to the final week of Body Armor. If you've enjoyed the, the series so far, let me hear you make some noise. Okay, right on, right on. Well, here's the deal. If Pastor Jeff would have come to me and just said, hey, Dave, you can have any of the six weeks in the series Body Armor, pick your favorite topic, and I'll let you preach on that, I'd have picked today. So it just worked out really well that he said, hey, Dave, will you preach week six of Body Armor? I am so excited about today. It's a topic I am super passionate about. Uh, so I'm going to maybe talk a little faster than I normally do because I just feel like there's a lot that I want to cover in today's message. Uh, get ready to take some notes. If you've got a journal and a pen with you, pull that out. Get ready. I've got a few recommendations that I'm going to give if there's a part of the message that I don't have enough time to really do a deep dive into, I'm going to recommend a resource, and you might want to write that down. So if you got a journal, get it out. If you don't have a journal, but you've got a phone with you, then get that out. Turn it on airplane mode so you won't bother anybody else around you, but have it out so you can take some notes today. Uh, I want to say thank you to Pastor Jeff for this opportunity, and I hope by the end of this, you're like, man, I am glad that Pastor Jeff let Pastor Dave preach this message today. That's my hope, all right? So uh, today I'm going to have a few recommendations. You will gonna, you're, uh, might want to write those down. I also am going to have a three-step plan that if you implement this in your life, it will change your life, okay? Not because I'm so great, but what you would be implementing in your life is great, okay? So I want to conclude this teaching series by taking us all the way back to the very beginning of the series. At the beginning of the series, we looked at Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, and we're going to go back there, we're going to review, and we're going to kind of refresh our minds about what is going on, what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6. So while you're maybe finding that in your Bible, I want to give a little bit of context, because I realize some of you, this is your first Sunday at New Life. I realize for some of you, this is maybe just your first Sunday as a part of this teaching series. So let me give you a little bit of context for Ephesians, the whole book, and then we'll dive into what Paul said and what we've based this series around. So Paul, he's writing to a group, a, a church, a group of believers in the city of Ephesus. And Ephesus was the most important city in the region of what is now modern day Turkey. It was an influential city. There was this group of believers there. And so he wrote a letter to them. And some theologians feel like it was kind of a form letter that he could have put any church, uh, any city at the, at the beginning of it and sent it off. Uh, but here it is. He's got a few reasons why he is sending this letter to the church in Ephesus. One, he wants to see them grow in their faith, in their love, and their wisdom. Faith, love, and wisdom. How many of you would love to grow in faith, love, and wisdom? Okay, there's at least a few of us that would love to, you know, grow in faith, love, and wisdom. And so if we understand that that is why Paul was writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, then we can look at it and think, okay, there's probably something I can learn from what Paul is saying so that I can grow in faith, love, and wisdom. And there were three other things, three other reasons, three other purposes as to why Paul wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus. One was he wanted them to understand God better. Simply that. He wanted them to better understand who God is. He also wanted them to better understand God's will for their life. What is the purpose? What is the direction? What, why do you exist? What does God have specifically for you to do? He wanted them to grow in their understanding of God's will for their life. And then lastly, he wanted them, he wanted to encourage them to live a life worthy of being able to call Jesus their Lord, their leader, their Savior. Now last week, Pastor Tyler helped us understand that salvation is not something that we have to earn. We couldn't earn it, even if we tried. So it's not that Paul was trying to teach them, hey, you got to work so hard to then finally be worthy. No, he was saying, when you have surrendered your life to Christ, and you've received salvation in his grace and his mercy, then you should then want to live a life worthy of being associated with Jesus, being able to call him your Lord and your leader. How many of you would love to know God better or his will for your life? I think all of us would. 
All of us would love to grow in our knowledge and our understanding of those things. And then when we do that, when we grow in our understanding of who God is and his will for my life, then I can start living in a way that is more worthy of being able to call Jesus my Lord and my leader. If you're here with us today in any one of our campuses, here in Kearney, Ogallala, North Platte, New Life Online, and you have yet to surrender your life to Jesus. You've yet to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to give you control of the direction of my life. You're going to have an opportunity to do that at the end of service in all of our campuses. And I pray that you'll make that decision. So with that as our context, let's jump back into Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Read it with me. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh, flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Pause for a second. This is our reminder of what we're about to read, why it is essential. There is a war going on, and we are in the midst of it. The believers back in the day that Paul was writing to were in the midst of this war with the unseen powers and, and principalities and rulers, and we are no different. We, too, are in the midst of a war. We're not talking about this little like minor skirmish or a kerfuffle or we're not in the midst of just something that we're going to later joke about. We're in the midst of a war. Think to yourself, what challenges have you faced in your life? What obstacles, what roadblocks, what challenges have you faced in your life or maybe you're currently facing? Were they physical. There was some sort of injury that happened and you had to overcome it. Maybe it wasn't even your fault. Maybe you've had to overcome or you're wrestling currently with, with challenges in your mental health or your emotional health. And then when you realize, well, Paul is telling me there is a war going on. There is a devil, there is an enemy who wants nothing good for my life. Well, maybe, just maybe, I've experienced some of this spiritual warfare going, around, going on around me that I can't physically see with my eyes. Now, as a caveat, I do want to say that not every struggle we face is a result of the intense spiritual warfare going on around us. Sometimes we face challenges that are meant to discipline us, that are meant to test us in a good way. So some of the challenges we face are for our benefit and they are for our good. But there are many things that we face that are a result of the spiritual warfare going around us. And, and it would do us well to realize that. So given what Paul writes in these verses, it'd be foolish of us to not realize that there's this war going on and that we're in the midst of it. With that said, let's read. Paul's instructions. What do we do? Because you didn't come to church to be depressed. You didn't come to church to, you know, for somebody to just make it all seem doom and gloom. Paul, he also then gives us instructions of what we can do in light of the fact that there is this war going on. Let's take a look at verse 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. And then read the rest of it with me. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit which is the word of God, what we would refer to as the Bible. Take the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, the Bible, and use it in this battle. 
Paul establishes that there's this war going on, and then he outlines the armor of God that we should use to protect us and defend us. But then he ends it with giving us one weapon. One weapon that we can use in this spiritual war. God's Word. The sword of the Spirit. There's just one problem. There's one tiny, small, minor problem that actually is a really big deal. One problem, and that is that all too often we try to fight the war going on around us without ever picking up the sword of the Spirit. We try to face battles alone. We try to figure things out on our own, and we never pick up, or too rarely pick up the sword of the Spirit, the very Word of God. Don't believe me? In the annual State of the Bible report, uh, report released last year by the American Bible Society, data shows that only 1 in 10 American adults read the Bible every day. And if I could be honest, I was surprised it was that high. 1 in 10 American adults read the Bible every day, yet every one of us exists in the midst of this spiritual war. When I first read that, I, I wasn't surprised that it, you know, that it was as low as it was. I thought maybe it'd even be a little bit lower. But here's the deal. I don't want you to think, oh man, he's up on his high horse. He must have it all figured out. It didn't surprise me because for a period of about seven years, I never picked up a Bible. I know what it's like to live life and to try to figure things out on my own and, and think, well, maybe I'm just smart enough or maybe I can just try hard enough or to be so apathetic that I just didn't care to pick up the Bible. So if you're here today, and you're hearing my voice, and you don't pick up the Bible daily, I want you to know there's no judgment from me. I can relate to you. My hope is that through this message, you're going to learn a few things, or God's going to stir in your heart, and you're going to be drawn and compelled and inspired by Him to pick up His very Word and see what He has to say to you. As a side note, if one of your hurdles for why you don't pick up the Bible is because you question how valid it is, you question, has it been preserved over these hundreds of years? Is it really God's word as he intended it? I had that same struggle. I didn't pick it up because I thought there was no way that it was actually valid and preserved and true until I read a, a resource like The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. You can go much deeper in this book than I can in a 30-minute message, but this book changed the way I viewed God's Word. Is it a substitute for God's Word? No, I'm not saying that, but read this and it will cause you to look at God's Word differently, and I believe will increase your passion to go and read what God has. Now, you're probably looking at that, some of you, I know you, because I am you, uh, you're looking at that thing and that's too long. All right, that's almost 300 pages. I'm not reading that. I'm not a reader. That's why I would also suggest more than a carpenter. Look at that. Glorious. It is not even 130 pages, okay? Covers basically the same content. If you are hung up with the validity of the Bible, pick up one of those. The uh, Case for Christ, Lee Strobel, or More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell, and I believe it will strengthen uh, your faith when you do so. So why is it that 90% of American adults don't pick up the Bible and read it every day? Why don't we pick up the sword that God has given us to use to protect ourselves, to stand firm, to stand our ground, but also to take ground in this war? Why don't we? Well, if you could let me speculate, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out two reasons, or as my dad would say, excuses for why we don't do this. The first one is availability. It's a little counterintuitive, but in America, the Bible is so readily available, it's like we are desensitized to how special it is. If you've got your cell phone with you and you've downloaded YouVersion Bible app, you have so many different versions of the Bible readily available all the time, wherever you go. You can download them to your phone. So if you don't even have Wi-Fi access, you still have the Bible with you in your pocket. You can go to the bookstore and buy from a whole different, you know, a, a range of different Bibles and translations and study Bibles and this and that. The Bible is so readily available, 
that in America, I think we're desensitized to how special it is. In parts of the world, there are people that would weep, that do weep, when they get their hands on their very first copy of the Bible because they've lived so much of their life without it. Here in America, we, we have it readily available. Let me give you kind of a, a, an illustration of this. My dad had a brother named Max, and he lived in San Francisco for a number of years. And when you think of tourist attractions in San Francisco, you think of the Golden Gate Bridge, okay, probably. And then you think of this maximum security prison sitting out on a rock out in the bay called Alcatraz. Alcatraz, it's fascinating. But here's the deal. My Uncle Max, do you think he went to Alcatraz living in San Francisco? For years, he never did. He never went to look at it, to tour it, to have his life like scared out of him by like letting the door shut and you're in the prison. And he never went until my dad was like out there on business. He's like, Max, you have to go. You live in San Francisco and you've never been to Alcatraz? Like, I'm out here on vacation or business trip, we're going. And he took Max to Alcatraz. Why didn't Max go? Because it was readily available. It wasn't a big deal until it was a big deal for my dad. And then he finally went. I think it's the same thing with the Bible, guys. It's so readily available that we get just so accustomed to it that we get desensitized to how special it is. And we don't pick it up. We don't pick it up like we should. A second reason, second excuse for why the Bible, daily Bible reading is so low in America, I would say the second thing is complacency. In America, we live with a high level of convenience and comfort, which makes it easy to become complacent. I love convenience as much as anybody. I love comfort as much as anybody. But those two things add up to an unfortunate byproduct of complacency. If my life is, by most accounts, pretty convenient, pretty comfortable. It can be easy. It's foolish, but it's easy for me to become complacent and not pick up God's word every day. Let me give you an example of how convenient or how much we value convenience in America. Think about where you get your food, okay? For some of you, thank God for you, your farmers, your ranchers, you grow food, you develop food for the rest of us. But for most of us, the average American, we get to just go to the grocery store, And we get to buy the food off the shelf. We didn't have to go through the struggle and the blood and the sweat and the tears of of raising crops and and animals and things like that. Now, I know some of you guys are gardeners. I love my wife gardens, and and I love that. Uh, But a few years ago, man, we decided it, it wasn't convenient enough to just go buy the stuff in the store and pull out what we want from the shelves that we were like, you know what? I want to be able to order my groceries and just go pick them up without actually walking in the store. Because I'd rather maybe talk to the one person that's going to put them in my car than have to talk to everybody else in the store. And then that wasn't convenient enough, and we thought, you know what? I don't even want to go to the store. I don't want to drive over there. I don't want to put pants on today, so I'm just going to order them and have them delivered. Do we value convenience? Do we value comfort? Yes, and the unfortunate byproduct is complacency. Because of how convenient and relatively comfortable our lives are, it's easy to forget what Paul said, that there is a spiritual battle going on all around us, a war that requires God's armor and the one weapon that he's provided us. When we read Paul's description of the war, evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, mighty powers in this dark world and evil spirits in the heavenly places, it can be difficult to grasp what's truly going on. So I want to take us to a little bit more of a concrete example of the war that's going on. In Matthew chapter 4, we read this story. Jesus has been led out into the desert and he's out there and he's fasting for 40 days And it tells us that in the midst of these 40 days, the devil shows up and he starts to tempt Jesus. You see, he's trying to look at some of the challenges that Jesus is facing. He's hungry, he's thirsty, he's hot, and the devil is trying to capitalize on that. And so he starts to tempt Jesus. 
He wants to fool Jesus. He wants to trick Jesus. He wants to play into Jesus' humanity and some of the struggles that Jesus is facing as he's, as he's fasting for 40 days in the desert. And he thinks, I can get to Jesus and I can get Jesus to bow down to me. The first time he goes to tempt Jesus, I want to read to you what Jesus' response was. Here's not this abstract, unseen world concept that's hard for us to understand. This is Jesus and the devil face to face in the desert, and the devil tries to tempt Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But Jesus told him, No, I'm not going to turn the stones into bread to eat them to satisfy my hunger. No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If Jesus says we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God, then don't you think we ought to be engaging with the Bible every single day? I mean, no one in their right mind would be like, well, you know what? I'm going to be healthier this year than ever before. I'm going to eat healthy at least twice this year. You can't expect to be healthy if you eat healthy twice in a year. What about two times a month? Is that going to leave you healthy? How about two times a week? No, we want, if we want to be healthy, we need to eat healthy every day. If we want to be spiritually healthy, we need to pick up the sword of the Spirit, God's Word, the Bible, and read it each and every day. If you want to experience the victorious life that Jesus offers, it's essential that you put on the armor and you use the sword effectively. Now you may be thinking, I mean, I know I, we let our heads get filled with all sorts of reasons why I'm not good enough to read the Bible. I don't, I'm not smart enough to understand the Bible. I didn't grow up in church, so I, I just don't have the same foundation. We have, we have all of these doubts. We have all of these reasons, all of these obstacles of why I can't engage with the Bible every single day. And today I want you to know there's a three-step plan for you. And if you implement it in your life, it will change your life. Not because I'm so smart, okay? It's not because it's my three-step plan, but it's because of what you'd be implementing in this three-step plan and who's behind it and who inspired it and who still uses his word to speak to us today. So are you interested in this three-step plan? The first step is this, pick up the sword pretty simple. Turn to your neighbor and say, pick up the sword. Pick up the sword. Read God's word daily. My suggestion is to start your day. Start your morning in God's word so that it has the chance to, to impact the rest of your day. There's a song that I love. It is my favorite song, Morning Routine by River Valley Ages. It is a beautiful song, and it's all about the power of uh, of reading God's word in the morning every day. I told my wife, when I die, I want this played at my funeral. If I die at a young age, I want you to play this for our kids and let them know what this says about the Bible. That's how your dad felt about it. So River Valley ages, morning routine, listen to it today. Reading at night, guys, it's good. I don't have any problem unless that's the only time you read the Bible is at the, in the night. I know some of you are like, well, I'm not a morning person. Well, maybe it's because you haven't been reading God's Word in the morning that you're not a mor morning person. But here's the deal. Reading the Bible at any time during the day is a great thing. But I want to just quickly make the case that if you only read the Bible at night, you're missing out on it impacting the rest of your day. I love this quote from Campbell McAlpine. He says, having our main time with the Lord at the end of the day, is like tuning the instruments after the symphony is over. It's like getting back from the battlefield, and as you're going to lay your head on the pillow, then you pick up your sword. Nobody would do that. Nobody in their right mind would go out to a physical battle and wait till they get home to put their head on their pillow to pick up their sword like it's some stuffed animal or it's a, you know, a, a, a security blanket. No one would do that we got to fight the battle with the weapon that God has given us. So let's pick it up early in the morning. Let me address a couple of quick questions. It might be hang-ups for some people. I haven't maybe been able to understand the Bible. Which translation should I read? The New Living Translation is a great translation. 
It is written or translated in a way that is similar to how we talk day to day, and it's still highly accurate. So the New Living Translation, we love it here in New Life. We tend to preach from the New Living Translation. Another one, if you're somebody that is, is really intellectual and you love to study God's Word and really dig into it, another one that is highly accurate that I love to use for studying is the English Standard Version, ESV. Uh, it's not my notes, but another question I get a lot of times is, where do I start? Where do I start with the Bible? Because a lot of times, and I tried this and I failed, I don't know how many times, a lot of times we think, well, we got to read this like we read every other book, so I'm going to start at the beginning and just read it straight through. And you get a little ways into it and you get bored out of your mind or you're so confused you have no clue what's going on. Or maybe that was just me, all right? My life changed when I was like, you know what, I want to read about Jesus' life. So I'm going to start in Matthew, which feels a little weird because that's like two-thirds of the way through the book. But I'm going to start in Matthew. Or if you're a tough guy, you got muscles the size of Pastor Chris's, then start in the book of Mark, okay? It's all about power. It's all about the miraculous power of Jesus. Pick up there. You're not going to be bored reading Mark. If you want to know who God is, read Psalms. That's what I've been doing recently. And I've been reminded of who God is. What's his nature? What's his character? Who is God in my life? What does he want to do in my life? I read Psalms and I'm reminded every day. So those are a couple of ideas for you. Um, real quick, don't read the Bible like you read every other book. I've already kind of joked that when I pick up a book, one of the first things I do is I check to see how long it is. And it's not so much, am I, man, am I really going to finish this? It's more of like, how long is this going to take me? Do I need to plan like the next month of my life to read this? Am I going to get through it in a week? Is it going to take me six months? Don't read the Bible that way. Don't read the Bible that way. In fact, here's what I would encourage you to do. Have this mindset. This was a mindset shift for me that changed my interaction with God's word forever. I really, I, I pray something like this before I read it. I just say, God, I want to draw near to you as I read your word. Use it to speak to me. And I don't go into my Bible time, my Bible reading, picking up the sword in the morning. I don't go into it saying, okay, I'm gonna, I have to spend an hour in God's word. I don't say to myself, i got to read seven chapters for it to count. But I pray and I just say, God, I want to draw close to you. Point out to me what you have for me today as I read. And if I come to something that I sense God has highlighted to me, or there's a question, I don't just keep reading. I stop and I ponder and I pray and I begin to journal. Some of you are not journalers. That's okay. Different times in my life I haven't been either. But that's how I've begun to process what is it God speaking to me. What are the questions that I have? What do I feel like God is trying to say to me through this? And that has been really helpful. That mind shift, mindset shift away from being more task-oriented to, God, I just want to draw close to you. I want to hear from you has been a game changer. All right, so first of all, we have to pick up the sword. We have to pick up the sword. The second step in this three-step plan, pick up the sword and then train with the sword. Turn to your neighbor and say, train with the sword. That just means discuss what you've been reading. If you're not having any conversations with any person or any people about what you've been reading, chances are you're missing out. You're missing out on a, a, an aspect of being sharpened by God's Word. I, I don't know if any of you guys are boxers. As you can tell, I'm not. Okay, But in, boxers, in boxing, there's a term for who you train with. When you get into the boxing ring and it's not an actual match, you're just training. That's called your sparring partner. And that sparring partner is someone that you are trying out techniques on. And you're testing your endurance. And you're going back and forth. And you're sharpening one. And the other person's sharpening. You're going back and forth sharpening each other. You're making each other better. Making each other more fit. Find a sparring partner when it comes to the Bible. I'm not talking about somebody that you need to fight and argue with. I'm talking about sharing what God has been saying to you through your time in the Word and asking them and seeing what God has been speaking to them as well. One of the most quoted verses of the Bible is Proverbs 27, 17. It says that iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Be the kind of friend that is sharpening your friends. Do it by training and speaking about what God has been doing in your life. 
when you read his word. One, one quick thing about this. Uh, if you don't have somebody that you are speaking to regularly about what you personally have been reading in God's word, in less than a month, we've got life groups kicking off here at New Life at all of our campuses. Get in a life group where you're going to find those partners to, to talk about God's word with, and you can begin sharpening each other. One last thought on the whole concept of training with the sword Find somebody from a different generation. It doesn't have to be the only person you talk about the Bible with. But if you're a parent, talk to your kids about what you've been studying. And let them know when there's something that, man, God drew my, drew my attention to this, and I'm not sure why he's, you know, it doesn't always have to be with absolute certainty. Like you're some Bible expert that has it all figured out. Just talk to your kids. Let them, let them catch you reading the Bible. That's why I read the paper version and not my digital version. Unless my kids aren't around and I'm traveling or something like that. I pick this up because I want my kids to see and not just think I'm scrolling through social media or scrolling through ESPN or whatever. Let your kids watch you, catch you, read in the Bible. And then I would also say with this concept to find someone from a different generation than you. I meet with my friend Lee. He is he's a generation older than me. We meet three times a month and we sit down and we talk about what God has been speaking to us as we each separately read the Bible. And it is one of the most life-giving moments of my week every time we get together. So if you're somebody a little bit younger, go ask, initiate conversation with someone in a generation above you. If you're somebody in an older generation, do what Lee did and initiate it with somebody younger. Lee came to me and asked if we could meet, if I would be interested in that, and I'm so glad I said yes. All right, so talk about the Bible with someone from a different generation. Step one, pick up the sword. Step two, train with the sword. And step three, fight with the sword. We don't pick up the, the, the sword just to be inspired although that's great. We don't pick up the sword just to be encouraged, although that's great. We pick up the sword so then we have it and we can fight. So be ready. After you've picked it up, after you've trained with it, use it to fight. And if you do that, great things will happen. We'll get to that in a minute. What happens if you don't pick up the sword? What happens if you don't learn to train with it and fight with it? You're going to live a life lived with more lies than truth. In John 10, Jesus tells us that the devil, the devil's out to steal and kill and destroy. And one of the primary ways that he does that is to fill us with lies. I don't have time to go into it, but Live No Lies by John Mark Comer dives into this primary tactic of the enemy. And he gives some practical advice of how you can use God's word to combat the lies that the enemy tries to get you to believe. Probably a top 10, maybe top 5 favorite book of mine. Live No Lies by John Mark Comer. If you don't utilize the sword, then your mind will be saturated with the lies of the enemy. I'm going to read this so that I get the the details accurate. Uh, According to the National Science Foundation, an average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts every day. Of those, 80% are negative and 95% are repetitive thoughts. So if we repeat those negative thoughts, we think negative way more Then we think positive. And let me ask you this. How many of those negative thoughts are rooted in God's word? I'm going to guess zero. Because as I read God's word, I don't see him telling me that I'm a failure. I don't see him telling me that I'm worthless. I don't see him defining me by my worst mistake. So those negative thoughts that you're having, chances are they are not from God's word. And if we never pick up God's word, if we never pick up our sword, we're going to lose that battle. The battle to be able to live free, to be able to live on God's truth. We may be saved by our faith in Jesus, but we may not live in the freedom that he offers unless we are filling our minds and our hearts with God's word. So, what is possible when you pick up and train and then you fight with the sword that God's given you? Your life will be built on a firm foundation of truth. There won't be room in your head for the lies of the enemy because it will be so full of God's truth. And when the enemy tries to tempt you with that lie, you'll be able to combat it and say, no, that's not true. That's not true because I'm chosen. 
I am forgiven. I, I, I'll never be forsaken. God's not going to fail me. I get to combat the lies and live on a foundation of truth. You won't live in the bondage of the enemy, but in the freedom of Jesus Christ. John 8, 31 through 32 says this, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, he said this to his believers, his followers, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you feel like you've been living in bondage, you've been feeling like you can't win some of the challenges that you face in your mind or your, with your emotions, I've got two last resources. One, I would encourage you, Winning the War in Your Mind by Craig Rochelle. The best practical advice I've ever uh, read on renewing your mind with the truth of God's Word. Winning the War in Your Mind, and the other one is then a mindset free. This will help you live in freedom based on God's Word. How do you meditate on God's Word? For those of you that love short books, this is another one for you. All right, A Mindset Free by Jimmy Evans. When you pick up and train with the sword, you'll, you'll find that God more clearly speaks to you. You'll wind up experiencing a closeness with God that can't be experienced any other way. James 4.8 was a verse that mattered a lot to me early on in my faith. And I rest on this promise even today. James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You want a closer relationship with God? You want God to draw near to you? Pick up his word every day and utilize it. I've got a friend here at our Carney campus. His name's Chase Leach. And we have had some conversations recently uh, about how the Bible's been impacting his life. He grew up here. He didn't have an ideal childhood in, in some senses. In other senses, he had a great childhood because he had grandparents that got him to church and helped him find uh, a foundation here. But it wasn't until the last couple of years that he started reading the Bible similarly to what I shared today. Read with the mentality of, God, I just want to hear from you. I want to draw close to you. And, and so we've had these interesting conversations. And so with his permission, I said, Chase, can I share part of your testimony today? And he said, absolutely. Anything, anything to glorify God, I want to be a part of it. And so I asked him, I said, why did you decide to get more serious about reading the Bible? Here's what he said. I wanted to give God more of my time. One of his many promises is that he will always be with us. I wanted to show him the same respect and take time to spend with him. I asked him then a follow-up, well, what effect has regularly reading the Bible had on your life? Here's what he said. It's been more rewarding than expected. Through God's word, I understand my purpose. How many of you want to understand your purpose better? Be like Chase, find it in his word. I don't feel as if I'm blindly following, but I take time to listen what God would expect of me, and then I ask him for his help to complete it. Now I look to him as my focus and not to what I want first. And then I can know with confidence that I am completing God's will and not my own. And that's where I find fulfillment in doing what God created me to do. So guys, it's simple. Pick up the sword. Train with the sword. And then fight with the sword. Before we pray, I invite you to stand. And I want you to hear these Final words from Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's pick up the sword. Let's use it. Why don't you pray with me? Father, thank you for your instruction to put on the full armor of God. Thank you for giving us a weapon that we can fight to stand our ground, to overcome the enemy, to be able to even take ground for you and your kingdom. May we not be complacent. May we not be desensitized to how special your word is. May we pick it up daily. 
May we engage with you through your word. May we let it seep deep into our hearts to where it changes the way we live our life. May we be great at picking up the sword, training with your word, and fighting alongside you. God, as we do this, I pray that we would experience your freedom and your blessings as you are right there with us as we read your word. God, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.